gone. And, uh, oh yeah, I was going to read to you some scriptures before I share out of John. A um, little bit different translation here. <coughs> this is Jesus speaking. <coughs> Excuse me. Excusez-moi. I'm telling you the most solemn and sober truth now. Whoever believes in me has real life, eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the, the manna bread in the desert and died, but here is bread that truly comes down out of heaven. Anyone eating this bread will not die ever. I am the bread, living bread. <clears throat> Uh, at this, the Jews started fighting among themselves. How can this man serve up his flesh for a meal? But Jesus didn't give an inch. Only in so far as you eat and drink flesh and blood, the flesh and blood of the Son of Man, do you have life within you. The one who brings a hearty appetite to this eating and drinking has eternal life and will be fit and ready for the final day. My flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. By eating my flesh and drinking my blood, you enter into me and I enter into you. <clears throat> Many among his disciples heard this and said, this is tough teaching. <laughs> the next line really got me. Too tough to swallow. Oh, I get it. I get it. Talking about bread and eating his flesh, too tough to swallow. Jesus sensed that his disciples were having a hard time with this and said, does this throw you completely? <laughs> Every word I've spoken unto you is spirit and it is life. Some of you are resisting, refusing to have any part of this. Um, so after this, a lot of his disciples left. They no longer wanted to be associated with him. Then Jesus gave the twelve their chance. Do you also want to leave? <clears throat> so in uh, John 6 and verse uh, 51, we actually covered 51 a little bit, or mainly last time, I think. <clears throat> I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give him is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Um, so Jesus, <clears throat> in desiring to bring um, them, us, to the Father's heart realizes that they're going to have to pass through him. They're going to have to be in him. They're going to have to, um, they're going to have to partake of him, not just believe in him. Um, and so here in John 6, it says that. It it's, it's begins to point that out more and more, that this is the way. This is... Um, how you're going to be raised up. This is, I mean, these are, the, these are the kind of things he was saying, if you look real close in him, that <clears throat> then in John 6, he is saying this is the Passover that was spoken of in uh, verse 4. This is what frees you, not from Egypt, but from you, but more than that, this is what will give you strength to carry you into the promised land, into the things that are in God's heart. <clears throat> and so, especially in the Father's heart. So Jesus says to fulfill that plan, to fulfill that, then uh, he wants his flesh inside of us. He wants us to partake of him, not just to believe in him, not just to follow him, not just to minister for him, not just to be about his business, but Jesus is standing there 
and he fed the 5,000, and now he's gotten off on this this discourse, and he sa he's saying, look, this is what is important. I like the beginning of that other one. That I forget exactly how that was, but it was uh, well said. Um, I'm telling you the most solemn and sober truth now. And he begins to talk about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, and that this is, this is what, this is, you know, now we're solemn. Over there we had a feast. Over there, 5,000. Over there, miracles. Over there, fun. Over there, provision for you in the earth. Okay? But now, Jesus says, I want to talk solemnly about what's important to reaching the ends that the Father is after. And... <clears throat> so to do that, we have to partake of him and not just receive him and let him come in our heart. Can you see, can you see a difference between um, receiving Jesus into your heart at salvation and partaking of Jesus? Big difference, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. It's a big difference. <clears throat> so... So this is, this, you know, I'm the bread of life, partake of me. This is um, his desire concerning bread. Now, if you remember all of John 6, you realize that from start to finish, the big problem was that their desire for bread was completely different than his. This is his desire concerning what he calls bread, which he's the real, I am the true bread, uh, is the best way of saying it. Everything else was a shadow. He, Jesus didn't just look at a piece of, you know, a loaf of bread and say, hey, I'll be that, I'm the bread. You know, that was created because he was the true thing. Um, <clears throat> and so they are completely consumed with, the miracle and the feeding of the 5,000 and miracle bread. That's what they're, um, it just occurred to me that when I was a kid, there was a bread called miracle bread. Do you remember that? Anybody remember that? <laughs> anyway, uh, hmm, I ate that growing up. Anyway, um, but when I got older, I put away childish bread. <clears throat> anyway, uh, <laughs> so, um, so, this, this miracle was so big to everybody, and it involved so many people, and it was so profound in that it um, sustained people in a desert, okay? Uh, the Lord says that, wait, I'm, I think something's coming in from the Lord. We have, we have a message from God. <clears throat> Um, so basically, Jesus is saying no matter how big the miracle was, feeding 5,000 people, no matter how big that is, that, listen carefully, that can never get you into the heart of the plan of God. Can, it, that won't get you there. You can have even bigger and it won't get you there. You can have, you know, and we can focus on the, the tangible. We can focus on the surface. And, and I'm not, again, I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying that's not going to get you there. That's not going to get you uh, to that plan of the Father, which we've discussed. Son and the believer, and that upward movement through Christ into the heart of the Father for sons, okay. sons in the image of Christ. Well, so when Jesus is talking about partaking of His flesh and His His blood, He's not talking about just learning things about Him. He's not saying you know, fill your mind and partake of the teaching or this sort of stuff. 
He's saying that, son, that God's plan for sons, which we've already gone through a whole lot of scriptures in Hebrews and Ephesians and other places, to show that there is a plan that from the beginning, from the foundation of the world, as it says in Ephesians, that God wanted sons in the image of Christ. And, and Romans 8 says that, to be conformed to the image of his son. Okay, but that conformity is not, is not here's Jesus, and so, you know, Jesus has a beard, so I'm going to grow a beard, and Jesus has long hair, so I'm going to, well, I've already done that, but Jesus has sandals, and I'm going to put sandals on, or whatever, all this kind of stuff, and I'm going to conform. That's the wrong kind of conformity. This literally means you're going to have to eat of this to fulfill this. You're going to have to eat of the Son to fulfill the Father's desire for sons because they're sons in the image of Christ. See, and we can circumvent the son in this all together. We can just say, well, I, I'm a child of God. I'm a, I'm a son of God. We can put ourselves out over here and try relating to the father um, by any other means. And we're not going to function as sons. That's why I didn't put it in there because that's not being a son that he wants. He wants the son, but he wants it in his many-membered body. He wants every member filled with the life and the breath and the being of that son because from that, that's where he's going to get what his heart's desire was, an increase of Christ. We talk about it a lot. So uh, in verse uh, 52, 52 and 53, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh? Okay, so uh, let's, okay, uh, verse 52, the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh? Flip over real quick and look at verse 60. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? Anybody see, see a contrast in those two scriptures? Not a, 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 something that's equal, but a contrast? Anybody tell me what it is? In verse 52, it's the Jews speaking. In verse 60, it's the disciples speaking. It's getting worse. And then obviously down verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. So it seems that the higher that God's heart is lifted up, the further the reaction is, the more the tension is in the situation because they're, they're not in tune with Jesus' heart because Jesus is not speaking of something he's doing for himself. Okay, So for Jesus to make himself uh, flesh that can be eaten, uh, broken bread, as, as described earlier in John 6, broken bread or poured out wine, He's going to have to die to bring this heart desire about. He's going, or can I put it another way? He's going to have to give himself. And he's going to give himself for the Father. He's not giving himself for you. He's not giving himself for sin. He, he has looked. He knows. And this is what Jesus says. He even says it in, in these scriptures uh, in John 6. <clears throat> you know, no man knows the Father but the Son. Okay, so we read that and we say, okay, all right, that would be the equivalent of saying no man knows a member of the Trinity except another member of the Trinity. That's kind of how we look at that. <laughs> That's not what he's saying at all. He says no man knows a Father except a Son. Okay, and nobody at this time knows of the Father. This is why it was so shocking. Still, later on in this, when, when Peter, I mean, uh, uh, when Philip, Jesus says to him, you know, uh, Philip says, I, you know, show us the Father and it will suffice us. <laughs> yeah. Okay, if we showed you the Father, you still wouldn't see him as a father. You'd see him as God. You'd see him as something else. But you wouldn't see him as a father because you're not a son yet. But if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Okay. So he's the, he is the express image of the Father, 
but he's wanting this image, he's wanting us to conform to that image, and the only way that's gonna take place is he's gonna have to die for something greater than sins. All right, so, uh, we talk about the cross. The cross is for sins. We all know that. The cross is for sins. But Hebrews 2.14 says that through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Uh, we read that, know ye not, in Romans 6, know ye not that the old man is crucified so that he might put to death the old man. So you have um, Ephesians 5, and it says, Husbands, love your wives and give yourself the way he gave himself for the bride, for his bride. So to gain a bride, that wasn't the best translation of that, but you know the scripture. So to gain a bride, there was a death strictly that had nothing to do with sins that there was a death that had to do with all these and much more I'm just barely misting a thing yet. some of you who were Bible school students many years ago remember that I took the time and we literally filled up the board and y'all, some of y'all remember that we literally filled and I did it from all angles and everything and we filled that whole board up and showed that there was all of these I'm just going to say it like this for now all of these deaths for different things. Okay, so in the Old Testament you have, um, you have sin offerings and you have sweet savor offerings. You have all of these different angles to it. You have a peace offering within the, the, the uh, sweet savor offerings. You have meal offerings. You have all of these different angles of everything. Well, Jesus died once on the cross. Jesus didn't die many deaths. He died one death, but in that death, it fulfilled each and every one of the things that needed to be fulfilled. And he, in himself, in his understanding of what was the Father's heart or what was the, the need of the world or what was, you know, on and on and on, understanding all of that, he gave himself. He gave himself. Well, we might, quote unquote, give ourselves for, for a bride, but he, he did, you know, that was fine, you know. You remember what it says of, um, of uh, Jacob, that he served for a bride and he served for seven years and it was as nothing to him, okay? But Jesus bore our sins, but Jesus, you know, defeated the devil through that death. But Jesus did all of those things. And while he's hanging there on the cross, now he's just, you know, we, we think he's talking about the whole world. Maybe he is. I think he's talking about his murderers. Father, forgive him. In the throes of it, not afterwards when he gets over it. <laughs> you know, I mean, that, how many of us can end that? very situation while it's happened be with the Lord already and have that spirit and have that nature well you're not going to get that you're not going to get that by being a Christian you're not going to get it by going to Bible school you're not going to get it by trying hard you're not you're not you're going to get it by knowing the heart of the son and knowing the heart of the father and allowing the Holy Spirit to do a work beyond gifts beyond blessings beyond miracles and allow him to take you to a realm that no man knows about. The heart of the, of the Father, the heart of the Son. Eye hath not seen, ear hath not heard, neither have entered into the heart. To take you there, but we become so concerned that we bring God into this, this realm. Oh, well, we got, you know, I, we got to do world evangelization. Oh, well, we got to be, you know, We've got to take care of our children. Well, we've got to do all this. We've got a million areas, and, and that's great, but none of that is eating his flesh and drinking his blood. 
And we'll get into it, but let me just say that that's why he didn't just say, eat my flesh. He said, drink my blood also. And that's important. All right, so... Um, uh, and also verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. All right. So um, you see in verse 52 the resistance. Uh, they strove among themselves. They strove among themselves. The Jews that are there are wrestling with what this means. All right. Anybody here ever hear, eat my flesh and drink my blood and go, my God, is he wanting us to be cannibals? You know, I mean, you know. Um, I have not seen, ear hath not heard. We're not gonna get it by, because there's, no, there's never been a thing like this before, never. And there's never been an entrance into it like there is this one. And it has to be understood by the Holy Spirit. Then he's going to get into that. He's going to say, the words that I speak are spirit in their life. They're going, well, we're living and we've never heard of such a thing and it sounds pretty vile to us. And he's going, that's because you don't understand it. And, and all of their reactions are because They've never heard it before, so this can't be right. Amen? Every one of you should have by now experienced uh, people having a hard time with what, what you share because they've never heard it before. And it, therefore, it, the, the common thing is it can't be right. There's no way this can be right. The vast majority are flowing this way. You know, Jesus wasn't concerned with the vast majority. Jesus was concerned with the Father's heart, and he's telling it in, in words that the Holy Spirit could breathe, because that's the truth. So you, we could say, well, you could have made this a little easier. You know, you could have said this a little smoother, Jesus. Um, he's using words that are spirit and life in an effort to reach them, but you have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to, you know... The, th the thing is, is when you hear this, you have to go, I don't understand that. That's the first thing to do. The second thing to do is only you can open my heart, because we always say open my eyes. But their hearts weren't open. I read all of the verses where they're react reactionary. Like I said, tension going on, tension so high that a bunch of them are going to leave. And Jesus just carries right on. Okay. Well, how can he do that? Doesn't he care about the people? Doesn't he want them to get it? He cares about the Father's heart. And he figures whoever really seeks it and hears what he's saying, they're going to end up... What, what Jesus describes three times in John 6 is... They're going to end up being raised in the last day, but, but not the resurrection, we think. They're going to be raised to a new understanding of God, and we'll see that as we go down the scriptures here. Okay, so, so you see this resistance to Jesus, to Jesus speaking of his Father. Not just Jesus speaking of the Father, for Jesus speaking of his father, and he's finding resistance, and he's finding people who are not open to hearing, and he's finding people that are, that are set and narrow, and they can't, they can't reach into the holy of holies. They can't, it's just too dark, and it's too veiled, even though the veil is, you know, it's not like it's a, you know, brick, you know, or iron or steel wall like this and we can't enter in there you could have got in there if you wanted to so yeah but I would have died I know I know that's kind of the point nothing of what we are is supposed to be in there anyway but we have been raised up at the last day 
three times and made to sit together in heavenly places in union with Christ. Okay, so that union is going to be the outflow of all that the Father wants. And Jesus knows it. And Jesus is given to it. And Jesus, but, but see, Jesus didn't just go, hmm, okay, this is what you want. All right, Father, let's create this world and everything, and I'll see to it that your plan comes to pass. Well, thank you, Jesus. That's very magnanimous of you. <clears throat> Not at all. No. Jesus saw it in the Father's heart. I don't believe, I've said this before, I don't believe the Father said, here's what I really want from this. <laughs> and Jesus went, okay. And if you really want it, no, I think he saw it there in the heart of the Father. And I think that he, he said, this is, this is it. I'll, I'll bring this to pass. I see your heart, not the plan. You know, I see the eternal plan. It's so vivid and clear. Yes. Oh, holy God. Whom shall you send? Send, send me. I'll do it for you. And he's kind of going, you know, is this a sitcom? What is this? <laughs> what are you, the grinder? What is this? Anyway, so there's this. So there's this. <laughs> there is this reality, and you can't find it by searching. It, either your heart meets his heart, or you, you can learn all the terminology. You can, you can, you know, go through the Bible school and you can go out there and you can be spiritual to people because you know stuff that they don't know. Or, or you can make it your heart's desire to know the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son and through that Son and his heart toward the Father, you will be able to be given in a proper way, in a proper spirit. Spirit and life will, will feed you. It'll feed you, and it'll maintain you, and it'll keep you, and it will surround you, and it'll be your rear guard and your forward guard. It will, it, because it's spirit and life. It's not, and see, no one can take that away from you, but I guarantee, I guarantee if you learn all of the right stuff uh, and then you go to another church to, to serve or something like that, if you learn all the right stuff but you don't know the heart of the Father, it's going to fade. I promise you. I promise you. It's going to fade. And what they're teaching will become greater because it's, it was just a teaching in the first place. If there's an environment for it, it's solid. But if you don't have the heart of the Father and the heart of the Son in it, then you get out there and it just begins to fade. And you begin, you know, we're, we're chameleons at heart. You know, wherever, whatever coloring we get in there, then that's our coloring and whatever. And that there's, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's what we are. But there's something wrong with being that close to the Father's heart and not pressing in. That's, that's the deal. That's the deal. All right, so <clears throat> they resist. And, and why do they resist? Because it's not what they understand. They understand, bless me. They understand, feed me, but not your flesh, <laughs> not, not your blood. Anybody see that? They understand, feed me. But how can there be a heart? How can it turn so bad from feeding 5,000 and everybody loving him and pursuing him? I, we're seeking Jesus to massive amount leaving because they don't, you know, they don't see the difference between bless me and be in me or maybe that's the reason why they left. 
They see the difference. Oh, oh, we were in this for us. <laughs> we were in this for us. Oh, this is kind of going wonky on me here. I don't know, you know, if I use that word in Ireland. Anyway, um, this, <laughs> this is going kind of kind of weird for me here. I, I'm not sure if I'm up for this. <laughs> And that's what they said, except for they weren't that sweet. They weren't that sweet about it. They were reactionary about it. <clears throat> All right, so in verse uh, 54, He who eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. All right, so here again, he's talking about blood and flesh. He's talking about the spirit life, and the life is in the blood. Um, there's no biological explanation of that unless you talk about white blood cells and red blood cells and oxygen, which I was a medic, and we studied all that. The life is in the blood, but the but the the true life in relationship to what Jesus is speaking is that it is His Spirit life. It is the nature of His being that He's talking about taking in, and then but He also talks about flesh, which refers to manifestation. We we discussed this a little bit in one of our last classes. Um, he is more concerned not with manifestation but the spirit of the thing the spirit of life and that will manifest so he couldn't just leave it it is eat my flesh it can't just be the physical it has to be the spiritual reality behind it or it's just an act of whatever. It's just a manifestation, but it's not really even a manifestation. It's just an act in the flesh, you know. So he says, no, there's something that has to go along with this. It's not, you know, okay, we'd say, okay, well, there's Christian acts and Christian deeds and, you know, and let's name them, you know. Well, we should feed the hungry and we should, you know, go to the nations and we should... You know, preach the gospel in the prisons, and we should do this, and we should do that. And no, no, no. Folks, God isn't looking at that and going, oh, yay, yay, just do the acts that are necessary. I mean, do you realize that there's a whole bunch of that that was, that was in the old covenant? Yeah. Feeding the poor and helping and doing this and doing that and teaching and da, 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 all these kind of things. And when it was all said and done, God said, you know, when... Jesus shows up and they, they kill him. <laughs> Can you put it any plainer? You know, it looked, it looked right until Jesus showed up and then they went, wait a minute, this guy, is he's making us look bad in the good that we're doing. You know, somebody says, you know, well, I don't know about that church group over there. And someone else says, well, what about all the good they're doing? And the father says, well, where's my son? I want my son. I don't want deeds for my son. I want my son. I want its spirit and life. If you eat my flesh and drink my blood, it becomes part of who you are. It flows out of you. It is, and, you know, again, in the book of Revelation, you see that picture. You see, you know, have you seen the wife of the lamb? Uh, the, the, you know, the bride? And um, John says, no. And he takes him over and he shows him New Jerusalem. So there's the wife. There's the wife of the Lamb. And sitting in, and of course, her, her walls are in, as clear glass, transparent glass. And inside of her is the slaughtered Lamb on the throne, ruling in a real way, because th that's supposed to... That's supposedly the end of this thing. Supposedly a, a symbolic picture of the way it's supposed to be. That we're not just Christians. And, and, you know, the book starts, when it starts in Revelation 5, 
He's the lamb is on the throne, and we're all around it worshiping him. But there's a progression through the book of Revelation that moves from that to in the middle. They are followers of the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth, to the end where they are bearers, they are, they are keepers of him. They are the, the, the sheepfold, as it were. They are the house of the slaughtered Lamb on the throne. Enthroned, not just enthroned that we worship at from a distance because we're worshipers of the Lamb. We have to, you know, thank you for saving us. Thank you for healing us. Thank you for... It eventually moves to that spirit and that nature is in her. And what is the end result of that? There's a river that flows out of it. Well, Jesus alluded to this, but we didn't see it in the next chapter. I think it is John 7 where he says... Out of your innermost being shall flow rivers. So here you go. Jesus is on the throne. And, and what proceeds from the throne is the river of life. And it flows out of, it's flowing out of the throne. It's flowing out of him because he's the source. And it's flowing out of her because he's her source. And it flows out to the nations for the healing of the nations. All right. Do you, do you see a healing ministry going on there? You know, do you see big signs or people in boats? It's just, you know, floating, you know, down the river of life going, hey, that's what we're here for. You don't know no, the church, the bride is just with him. Her goal is to be, is to be uh, have him founded, the slaughtered lamb crowned and seated and enthroned and founded in the midst of her. And let everything that's supposed to flow out, flow out as life. And if it doesn't flow out as life, it's just us. Now I'm back to where I started to try to explain it. And that it can just be us. It can just be what we're doing. It can, believe, it can be our strongest beliefs that this is going to be what God wants. This is going to change the world. This is going to do Well, that's fine, good. All of us <laughs> started with that. <laughs> you know, I mean, we all did. But then our hearts got turned. Yeah, it turned me away from my coveted ministry. No, it turned you away from your covetousness. Unto the Lamb, so that His Spirit can be what's in every son, this nature, and this way. And what, what applies to the the son here with the, the bride down here, it applies to the father with the son, and it all flowing through him. It's the same spirit, just the father is getting one thing, and the son is getting something else, but they're similar. They're similar. All of it has to do with an increase of Christ, but not an increase of Christianity. You know, I, Deb and I were missionaries for a year, and you see, Jason have been missionaries, and you know you you um, you want to make an impact. You want to make an impact. You do. You desire to uh, to bring Jesus in a way that'll quote unquote change the world. All right, well, since Jesus died, I wonder how many missionaries have gone into the world? You know, 15, 20, I mean, what are we looking at here? 5,000, 50,000, 500,000, millions? And how greatly has the world been changed? And where churches have sprung up, say in Africa or wherever, is there not still deep-rooted problems of self and sin and that sort of thing? Is there not? And, there, and just stuff going on. Um, I believe that the impact is the impact of life. Um, I know... With Deb and I, we went on our 20th wedding anniversary back to Jamaica. We went there because, frankly, I was feeling burned out at the time. 
but we wanted to get away for our 20th wedding anniversary and and Christ for the Nations had a a um, kind of a place in uh, Montego Bay which was fairly close to where we were at we were yeah a Bible school there <clears throat> our I think you'll agree with this our understanding of what we thought we would find is probably nothing really of what we had done there um, we knew of nothing but we had the confidence to know that you know if we you know we're getting older if we die surely something happened you know um, and by several uh, divine interventions, God led us to a man who, just quite accidentally, if you put it, if you want to put it on that level, to a man who recognized me of all people, didn't recognize her. You got to rem remember that Jamaica is primarily black, <laughs> and she was blonde, and you know recognized me and said, I know you. And I said, no, you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And I said, no, you don't. And he said, uh, have you ever been here? I said, yeah. And he said, how long ago? I said, 20 years ago. He goes, I know you. And he proceeds to tell us of incredible things that had happened with the children in the orphanage that we raised and the, the church that I pastored and one thing after the other. Um, and my my grasp of that was every one of them wasn't like, well, you remember the time you did so-and-so? Or da-da-da-da? It was like life sprang forth, of which I knew nothing of nor could take any credit for, <laughs> even a little bit. It was so done that you couldn't take any credit for it, you know. And God knows I probably would have tried, you know, but, but it was too clear cut that this is the Lord and was the Lord and who knew, you know. We don't know, but we do know one thing, that our pursuit has to be of the Lord for the Father or of the Lord for what he desires. And that what, if, you, if you're there with that, if you're content with just allowing Christ, because this is your goal, allowing the Lamb of God, the slain Lamb, to be formed in you and then beyond formed, enthroned in you. This is what rules me. Then there's going to be a flow. And you won't take any credit. It'll come, it, and the bride won't go. Well, this is coming out of me. You know, this is. Oh, this is. I, I know I'm so special to him. That's why it's coming out of me. I bet he's proud of me, and he's going. You ain't doing nothing but sitting there. <laughs> you know, the the picture that I got some years ago was <clears throat> when Jesus was coming into Jerusalem uh, on Palm Sunday. And he told his disciples, go get him a, a donkey. And he gets on the donkey, and he's, he's riding into Jerusalem, and these people are lying in the streets, and they're waving palm branches and stuff like that. And the donkey's looking, and he's going, oh, I'm, I'm finally being recognized for what I really am and my importance. You know, people finally are getting to see how really important I am, you know. And... and uh, you know, he, the people are all looking in that direction, so he assumes that it's him, and he's walking all the way, and it just keeps on going, you know. And sometimes we're like that jackass. Can he say that? They call it that here in Texas. I don't know what y'all call it. <laughs> but sometimes we're like that. We still want to be in the center. We still, we're st we've been waiting. We knew it was going to happen. The, the big day of recognition where everybody would finally go, you really are something special, you know. 
And I, you know, I personally fought with that because I was raised in an orphanage and, you know, three foster homes and stuff like that. And, you know, you're just kind of waiting for somebody to, you know, I don't know how to put it into words, but you, you're hoping something will come of you and that somebody will think that there's something worth something so that if somebody says something, you go, oh, was that, you know, could that be true, <laughs> you know? Well, we're all, you know, have this, you know, delusions of grandeur that we're going to do something incredibly great. And is there anything greater than having the slaughtered lamb formed in us, enthroned in us, and married to us, and all that comes of life? flowing out of us because of him alone. Because of him alone. It's him, you know. Oh, the work you're doing, it's not me. You're so humble, it's not me. I'm not humble. <laughs> Normally I would have taken you to dinner just to hear what you had to say. <laughs> I'm talking how great I am. But... But I am, you know, I've given that stuff up. You know, I've abdicated the, the throne. And I've said, you know what, this is yours. You know, take your place, Lord. And then, even though it's a little early, I'll just end with this. And that is that <clears throat> Israel came out of Egypt. Uh, they went into the wilderness and they wandered for 40 years. And so when they entered the land, they, you know, set up Shiloh. And then shortly after that, they used it to fight against the Philistines. And the Philistines took it, and it was separated from them for a period of years. Long time from Egypt to David rising up. And, and David takes it, and he puts it in his backyard in just a another tent without the rest, without all the, all the ministry, just the Holy of Holies. You know what I mean? He just went in there and he's not supposed to go in there. David was always doing stuff he wasn't supposed to. <laughs> Never got struck dead. Other people did, you know. And he's just going, look, I just want to be with you. And everybody's going, well, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> if you're going to do it, do it decently and in order. Anyway, <clears throat> so it comes into David's heart, what? What comes into his heart is the heart of the Lord, because he has, was a man after the heart of God. That's what always was coming into his heart. I mean, can we not see how important David was to the Lord? Anyway, so it came into his heart, I want to build you a house. Because he, he was starting to build his house, and he went, wait a minute. You know, what about him? What about him? What about them? Can I make, you know, can we make ourselves a house for God to dwell by his life and spirit? So anyway, God says, sends his servant, says, you're not no, you're not going to do it. Solomon's going to do it. And so it puts it off a while longer, but David, just he's just, he's, he's saving up, and he's raking in the dough, and he's asking God, what do you want this temple to look like? You know, and God gives him the blueprint. He hands it to Solomon. He gives all the money to Solomon. He gives all of the gold, all of the, everything that's going to do it. He gives it to Solomon. And so the, the building starts going up and it finally gets done and the, the great moment comes in where the priests pick up the staves with the ark and they bring it in. And the Bible is specific about this. It says, and when the ark was put in its place, when he was put in his place where he's supposed to be in our hearts inside of us, when he was put in his place, the glory fell, the 
all the priests, all the singers, everybody who was there ready to do the big thing fell on their face. It says no one could minister by reason of the glory of letting him in the place that he wants to be instead of the place we keep putting him because he's going to benefit us. And when he did that, it was like, all the ministry's over. <laughs> okay, this is the end, people. You know, well, did that end the ministry? No, no, no. In truth, the spirit of that fills the temple. And it, there's a flow, but it's him now. And it can be him when he's in his place. It can be him when, when he's inside of her. But, but not just eat my flesh, drink my blood, drink, have my life in you. That, that he's enthroned in there and the flow can begin. And then comes the fulfillment of Jesus' words. Out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living water river of life this is the fulfillment of it and we thought it was about getting exciting excited during a worship service or during a ministry outreach or i feel i feel rivers flowing you know and he's he's going well whatever you're feeling that's not what i was talking about and we go no i think it is <laughs> i'm pretty sure this is it <laughs> This is exactly what you wanted. And he's going, no, this is not what I want. And he goes, I can't hear you, Lord. And he would say, why can't you hear me? He says, because what I'm thinking is louder than your voice. It just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's called... The, the folly of God, the foolishness of God. Yes. First Corinthians chapter 1. It's this wisdom is foolish to the natural mind. But when we see it vaguely pictured in a movie where somebody gives themselves for love, we go, oh. You know, and the Lord's going, stop it. Are you going to do it? No, no, but I love this. <laughs> you know, and there are some pretty good movies along those lines, but they still don't come close to what Jesus did. And they'll still, they, and they still don't move our hearts the way he should. Because our hearts shouldn't be moved for a cause or for ministry, our hearts should be moved for the Lord. And that's, that should be our goal. Amen. Let's take a break and we'll come back.